Thank you very much for this introduction speech. Uh, now I would like to greet um, to the Austrian ambassador, uh, Mrs. Sigrid Birka, uh, Birka, who kindly accepted our invitation and also director of Istituto di Cultura Italiana, Stefano, uh, Dr. Stefano Cerato. I would like to greet all participants of the symposium, some of whom have embarked on a long trip to be with us here today, for which I am especially grateful. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to open the two-day workshop Women and Post-War Transitions Politics in the scope of the project IRC Post-War Transitions in Gender Perspective, the case of the Northern Eastern Adriatic region. The project, which I have been leading since the beginning of the year, and is after the initial startup now in full swing, aims to explore as exten extensively interdisciplinary, comparatively and transna transnationally as possible women's position in the post-war periods, taking into account its social, ethnic, religious, and generational diversity. We are interested in the practices of inclusion and exclusion, support and hindrance, and marginalization of women in transitions after the First and Second World War in the area of present day Slovenia, Croatia, as well as in that of Italy and Austria and similarly after the Yugoslav Wars, particularly in the area that, that was part of the former Yugoslav Federation. One of the topics included in our analysis is closely connected to the changes that took place in the sphere of politics. New state borders and geopolitical changes that followed have reshaped one's sense of belonging redeterminate citizenship or legal and normative frameworks, frameworks. Historiography of the previously mentioned state, states has for a long time enlarged upon the subject of delineating borders activities of respective diplomacies before and after the war. More recent decades, have seen light being shed also in respective economic, social, and cultural consequences of watershed periods. However, I can state quite resolutely that, by and large, studies on post-war transition, transitions have neglected the gender question and have not addressed the question concerning the female population systematically and profoundly enough. What did geopolitical transformation mean to women? How did they experience them? How did they adjust to them or defy them? To what extent and how did women act as prom promoters of a new national political and ideological belonging? To what extent did they co-shape or passively accept them? Wars and revolution associated with them brought exclusions. The removal of social hierarchies, change of elites, they caused migration, loss of home, social status, civil and political rights. On the other hand, as we know, they also brought about the right to vote in Austria in 1918, in Yugoslavia 1945, and in Italy 1946. New times saw several established political and cultural practices fade into oblivion, such as the feminist tradition in Yugoslavia, or in Italy, in Austria, the partisan experience of women, mostly members of the Slovene minority. Old paths came to a halt, new ones were opened. Let us, for instance, think of the role of Vienna as political and cultural capital of the Habsburg Empire, also in terms of, terms of Slovene or Croatian feminists, 
or of Prague, the Empire's Slavic culture capital. After the end of the war, some less important centers of women's act activism, such as Trieste, lost their attracting power both in their Slovene and socialist-oriented part. Seeing that before the war, Slovene women intellectuals, especially teachers, left Carniola and Styria for Trieste, which became due the individual women's initiatives and as a liberal and cosmopolitan city, a synonym for women's emancipation. Following the end of the First World War, and particularly after the rise of fascism, the most politically active women, especially Slovene intellectuals, promoters, post-war women periodicals in Trieste and Gorizia, as Zhensky uh, Svet, had to make their way back to Carniola and Styria, Ljubljana and Maribor, or even smaller <laughs> centers along the Hungarian, Slovene-Hungarian border. Either due to the loss of citizenship, the fascistization of the society, or persecutions. Similarly, after 1918, 19, and 1920, new women's roots were established between Austria and the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, not only owing to departures and arrivals of Slovene women, but also those of German women who were forced to leave cities such as Celje or Maribor. Dwelling only upon the First World War period, I can say that a trans transnational view is vital also because it opened many questions associated with women's political activation in the background of the struggle for the new Yugoslav state. Uh, the Carinthian plebiscite, as well as the establishment of the Austrian Republic, Gabriele D'Annunzio adventure in Rijeka Fiume, the Red Revolution in Prekmurje, and etc. Actually, actually, where were women in November 1918? What were they doing and what were their thoughts? The question is a trivial one and yet very important for understanding the transition from women's activities in salons which were so prominently featured in, for instance, the ranks of the Italian bourgeoisie in Trieste to the charitable work and the post-war nationalist orientation, which on the one hand led Italian women in the Julian March to fascism and Slovene women on the other to anti-fascism. If we extend our view to Carinzia, we have to trace that part of women who supported uh, Nazism. I know I generalize the question of the national identity, but in this moment I mm, could explore more in this um, framework. Repositioning of centers and peripheries as a consequence of new state borders occurred also after the Second World War in, and in the 90s. This is to be taken into consideration when examining the formation of political scene and elites, as well as when shedding light on cities and roles women gained in them. Establishing continuity or discontinuity in post-war periods will without question lead to an analysis of the relationship between the public and private sphere, to establishing differences between women who were political leaders and those who were barely uh, evident in the public, to international connections and informal context, whereby the exploration of the North, uh, northern Adriatic region will not be able to keep away from conclusions and finding pertaining to the remaining part of state formation included in the research and in the broader international area. Actually, it was precisely, precisely that belief that led us in the organization of this event and prompted us to invite prominent experts who will help us to clarify the links between the processes of establishing 
the peace and women political and civil rights and examine similarities and discrepancies occurring in the respective European, European and other milieu. The array of cases and discussion we are about to hear is bound to make us realize the tenacity of certain paradigms and concepts. Before wishing us all pleasant work and stay, I would like to thank my closest colleagues, Anna Zervol and Ushka Sterle, for their engagement in the preparation of this event, event and our secretary, Polona Kapler, for uh, the work that she put into organizing it. I would like to invite my colleague, Irena Selishnik, to the microphone. She will introduce our first lecture, Professor Glenda Sluga, the author of excellent studies in the field of uh, gender studies, women's studies, but also an author of very important research, um, which she published in a book, The Problem of Trieste and the Italo-Yugoslav border, who is particularly interested for us. Thank you.